Um, hi, everybody. This is Bill Robert. Uh, I'm a consultant at Spy Pond Partners. I'll be um, introducing our, our webinar in lieu of uh, Matt Hardy uh, from Ashto, who couldn't uh, join us here today. We appreciate uh, all of you for joining us uh, to this special Thursday edition of the TAM Guide Book Club. Um, we did have a late uh, change in our date to avoid um, a conflict with the previously scheduled Ashto webinar. I know uh, many of you have been looking forward to that on BIM and asset management. Um, if you missed it, we'll be adding a video on that to the TAM portal shortly. So we apologize for any confusion that the scheduling change created. Uh, hopefully uh, by having the change, you, you're able to attend both the webinars and, and we thank our speakers for their flexibility in uh, making the, the time change. So this is the seventh book club meeting on the uh, TAM asset, manage the asset management guide. Our topic today is investment strategies in multi-objective decision-making or MODA. There is just one more TAM book club webinar on the calendar after this one. The last one is gonna be next week, June 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And um, the topic on that one is strengthening how data supports your TAM program. So if you want to register for that webinar or look at any of the past webinars or any other upcoming TAM webinars, uh, you can go to the Ashto TAM portal, uh, tam-portal.com, click TAM webinars under events in the main menu. Um, and we will, we look forward to announcing additional TAM webinars and you'll be able to uh, register for any upcoming webinars on the site. Um, links from from today's webinar with the video and the slides will be available on that site. And um, I'm, I'm sure if uh, Matt was on, he would encourage us all to uh, get a copy of the TAM guide. You can get a printed version from the Ashto mm -hmm. bookstore. You can also uh, view an online version of the guide at tamguide.com. Um, if so, in terms of today's webinar, if you have any questions, just use the chat feature of the webinar. And we do have a little, we'll have time for uh, an exercise, and a little time for open discussion at the end of the webinar today. So if, if Steve has made it on, we'll, we can, I'd like to turn it over to him uh, to welcome uh, us on behalf of uh, FHWA. Hey, thank you. You know, I had a little technical difficulty here with my mic, et cetera. Hey, last week, we had some great presentations and discussion on the topic of increasing workforce capacity. This week, we have a full agenda, and I'm excited to dive right into today's topic, investment strategies in multi-objective decision-making, or MODA. As you know, developing investment strategies is an important component of asset management and a critical element of your asset management plans. Hey, this is how the whole performance gap analysis, risk analysis, life cycle planning, financial planning all come together. And, you know, this session will help introduce you to the valuable material in the Astro TAM guide that can help advance your agency's approach to developing investment strategies and help the interest in enhancing investment strategies to include MODA. I also want to mention three valuable FHWA resources. The first is the Asset Management Financial Report Series. This was done, you know, several years ago and covers, covers some good material and really an introduction to why, why this whole financial planning is all important. I think you've all know the term. It's all about the money. This is where it all comes together. And the second is titled Developing Camp Financial Plans. This was published also in 2017. And we also have the Asset Management Plan Case Study, Financial Planning and Investment Strategies, which was published last year, which is based on some of the good practices we saw in the 2019 camps. You know, it, it's, a, it's an important subject where we talk about asset management, but if you're going to do true TPM, looking at your targets, looking at your long-term state of good repair, and looking at the funding the state DOT has in developing the investment strategies, this is where all this comes together. Our agenda today, we'll hear from team practitioners 
who will share their perspectives on investment strategies and MOTA from the experience in the agency. I'm looking forward to hearing from many of you on the line who are using the TAM guide to support strong asset management. I think you're going to enjoy today's session, and I hope you learn a lot. And finally, I really hope that you can join us again next Wednesday for the final TAM book club webinar on how data supports your TAM program. And now I'll turn it over to Mr. Bill Robert of SpyPond Partners again, who's going to lead us through our agenda and objectives for today. Bill. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so just quickly on our agenda, um, we're going, I'm going to say a few words about uh, this topic of uh, investment strategies and MODA from the perspective of the what's in the TAM guide. Uh, and we've got four uh, great uh, use cases that, that we'll present uh, following the, the intro. Uh, so we're really excited to have um, Lina Chapman and Michael Case from Michigan DOT, Randy Goodman from Louisiana DOTD, uh, Steve Wilcox and Michael Rossi from New York State DOT, and Mike Johnson from Caltrans all presenting. Um, after the state presentations, uh, we'll have um, an exercise, a quest, uh, and uh, uh, breakout sessions for, for that. And then we'll get back together after the breakout session. And we'll get you out of here by 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, so you can see the agenda is pretty full. So we're going, if we have time later, we'll do a Minty poll, but for now we'll skip the usual Minty poll that we've been doing in the other uh, webinars and go straight into the topic intro. Um, so, uh, what I just like to say a couple words about the topic. Um, I mean, first, what do we mean by TAM investment strategy? What we've got here on the slide is just the definition of an investment strategy from the uh, FHWA TAMP regulation. So it's a, a set of strategies that results from evaluating various levels of funding to achieve state DOT targets for asset condition and system performance effectiveness uh, at a minimum practical cost while managing risks. That's definitely a mouthful. <laughs> The next slide. Um, we do talk about the, um, the topic of, of forming an investment strategy as part of the topic of resource allocation in the TAM guide. Um, and if we look at what people have done in their TAMPs, there's really different approaches that they've taken in their TAMPs. One approach to defining what an investment strategy is, is to present different investment scenarios with different budget allocations or changes to other assumptions. And we'll hear uh, from Lina Chapman and, and Michael Case uh, from Michigan and Randy Goodman will talk about how their states did something similar to that for their TAMPs. Another approach to investment strategies is to uh, is basically assume that it's to write a narrative description of how investment decisions are made to accompany an agency's financial plan. Um, and uh, yet another approach is to um, provide a narrative description uh, describing different areas of emphasis uh, in an agency's uh, asset management program um, how and how the agency is going to try to achieve its desired state of good repair and so forth. So there, there are different approaches in the 2019 TAMPs for um, approaching this topic of what an investment strategy is. Okay, next slide. So in the uh, TAM guide, the way we, we present this, this topic is by presenting the idealized resource allocation process that's depicted here. Uh, we did talk about this process a little bit in a previous, one of the previous um, book club webinars. So I won't go into a lot of detail on it, but basically what we do um, in the TAM guide is we present this, this idealized resource allocation process. We talk about the different steps. We talk about how it can be applied in different contexts and some of the drivers and, and factors involved in resource allocation. And so that's all there in the TAM guide. I encourage you to take a look at it if you haven't read that part of the TAM guide. Okay, next slide. And then um, there is a strong relationship um, between resource allocation as it's discussed in the TAM guide and investment strategies uh, as they're defined by FHWA um, for the purpose of developing a TAMP. Um, basically, the resource allocation 
process and the process of developing investment strategies are, are equivalent. They're, they're very, you know, very closely related to each other. But the TAM guide doesn't, doesn't specifically say, here's how you meet the TAMP requirements. It's not a guide to, to meeting FHWA requirements. Um, different approaches are presented in the TAM guide, though, for improving, uh, for performing resource allocation and also for improving cross-asset resource allocation and investment strategy development. So what we talk about in the TAM guide um, on cross-asset resource allocation, is basically a kind of top-down approach where you use performance targets to guide resource allocation and also more of a bottom-up uh, approach where uh, you use multi-objective decision analysis or MODA to help uh, identify goals and objectives and prioritize investments. Okay, next slide. And this uh, next slide is just um, a screenshot from the guide uh, th that presents a, um, a checklist, or, or I'm sorry, it's a how-to guide going through the steps in implementing MODA. And that is in turn based on a recent NCHRP report, NCHRP report 921. And this, this is just showing a shot from the first page. This particular how-to guide goes up, it's like eight steps, it goes on for a few pages. Um, and um, okay, next slide. So that's just a quick overview of kind of how the TAM guide approaches this topic and how uh, what's in the TAM guide relates to the FHWA's requirements for TAMPs. Um, but now what we'd like to do is talk about how different states have approached this challenge. Um, so uh, Lina Chapman and Michael Case will first present for Michigan DOT, followed by Randy. Uh, from Louisiana, and then uh, Mike and Steve Wilcox from New York, and then finally uh, Mike Johnson from Caltrans. And our first two, two uh, talks will focus more on investment strategies that were, that were used in the state's TAMP. The second set of two presentations uh, will be more about a kind of uh, MODA and how the New York and California are trying to use MODA to, to make further improvements in how they develop their investment strategies. Um, since we do have a full slate speaker, speakers, I'll just remind all our speakers to try to keep it to about 10 minutes um, if they can. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to, to Lina and Michael Case from Michigan. Um, let me just say good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having us today. Um, happy to be kicking this off as well. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we are going to be talking about MDOT's approach to investment strategies in our most recent TAMP from 2019. Um, and we're also going to be covering a tool that we've developed called the uh, Project Identification Tool, uh, which has some links to multi-objective decision analysis that we'll cover. So, sorry for the delay. I actually, I thought I lost my, my mute button when I started. Yeah, and we'll we'll share the slides here so sharing. we can we can run the slides okay. on our side. I'm good at this point, so I appreciate the help. Okay. All right, nothing like a a good little bit of technical difficulties to kick things off here. So, can we see the screen? Yep. Great. All right. So, gave my little introduction here. Um, so I, we didn't go through introductions uh, for uh, who we are. So uh, I'll just cover, yeah, again, I'm Michael Case. I am the five-year transportation program specialist here at MDOT. Um, I've been with the department since 2020 and have worked in a couple of different areas. And with me today is our supervisor for the unit that I'm under, the systems evaluation and programming development section. Uh, Lina Chapman. So before I get into MDOT's investment strategies, uh, just a little bit of background in MDOT uh, and the system we manage. Michigan has just over 122,000 miles of paved roadways, including 9.6 thousand route miles or 27.5 lane miles of state trunk line. This makes us the 10th largest in the nation and the 28th largest state highway system. We also have a relatively large local agency network, as you can see on the right, which differentiates us a bit from other states. 
For the NHS portion, MDOT manages about 82% or 5,200 miles with the remaining managed by local agencies. MDOT also maintains about 4,500 bridges, 2,700 of which are in the NHS. I'll cover two not listed in either of these diagrams, but MDOT is responsible as well for about 665 miles of state-owned railroad lines, four state-owned airports, four intercity transit terminals, 215 park and ride lots, and a lot more. So this leads up to the fact that MDOT has a diverse set of assets under our umbrella. Um, so asset management actually has been both a mandate and a core value for MDOT uh, due to this for about two decades now, starting in about 1997. Uh, you can see the simplified version of our transportation planning cycle. Uh, and early on, asset management, as you can see, is an early consideration that starts with establishing goals, objectives, and policies. This drives a performance decision-making process that prioritizes attaining desired outcomes while maintaining consistent monitoring and enough flexibility to improve the way we do business. So into our TAMP, just a short overview here. Uh, another thing that differentiates us a bit is Michigan is one of the few states, along with Florida and a few others that have asset management principles and requirements codified into law. One particularly useful feature of our process is created through legislation, uh, and that's called the Transportation Asset Management Council, or TAMC for short. This body oversees processes and advises the legislature uh, and the State Transportation Commission, which is an oversight body of MDOT, on asset-related issues and opportunities. A link to the TAMC is provided at the end of this presentation. MDOT's investment strategies were developed utilizing anticipated available funding, life cycle planning, financial and performance gap analyses, and the results of risk analysis. These variables were investigated over the four strategies outlined in federal guidance as shown here. MDOT took the approach of really utilizing uh, some tools that's developed to uh, put together a gap analysis and analyze each strategy. Uh, so the gap analysis used MDOT's own model, uh, which is called the Road Quality Forecasting System, to analyze pavement, and ex which is expressed here as remaining service life. Uh, we also have a tool for bridge called the Bridge Condition Forecasting System, uh, which expresses bridge conditions by deck area. For locally owned NHS roads, the Pavement Surface Evaluation and Rating, or PASER tool, performance measure was used, which we've been using since 2004. So I'm only going to cover two of the strategies considered due to time restrictions, and the rest can be found in our 2019 TAMP, which we provide a link to at the end of this presentation. So we're looking at the state of good repair strategy for bridge, uh, for which Michigan's goal is 95% good fare by deck area on the NHS. So MDOT identified in this strategy a total shortfall of $323 million up to 2028, or $32 million per year, based on that gap analysis. This strategy uh, under a risk an analysis scenario uh, determined if funding were to be redirected from bridges not on the NHS to cover this gap, those assets would then face an un unacceptable decline in their condition. After identifying gaps for each strategy, uh, like the four up that were shown in the previous uh, couple slides back, MDOT identify the constrained investment strategy for implementation, which means that investments are constrained to available funding, minimize risk, have no financial gap, and manage assets for their whole life. So the next part of this process, and really the, the heart of our asset management, comes down to the call for project process where uh, all of the investment strategies, uh, the desired mix of fixes that have been identified through analysis and funding targets that were developed are provided in program instructions to our seven region offices each year. Based on these factors, projects are proposed by the regions that meet the desired goals and are reviewed by uh, various subcommittees uh, with, with expertise 
uh, for approval and project selection. Each year, MDOT assembles a five-year transportation program that compiles these processes into a single cohesive and public-friendly document. This process provides MDOT the opportunity to review state and federal revenues, impacts of augmented programs, and financial and performance gaps affecting meeting program goals, and serves as the foundation for the federally required state transportation improvement program. We complete a five-year program uh, and submit it to the legislature by March 1st as each year as we're required to do by law. So that concludes the investment strategy portion of our presentation and I'll turn it over to Lina Chapman to talk about the pit. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> Excuse me. And thank you for the opportunity to share some information with you today. I'm gonna to talk about the PIT or the project identification tool, which is an application that we have in flight. Um, we're working in collaboration with Mayview Solutions um, and this application will likely become part of the AstroWare suite of products and available to other states for use in the future. Um, so I'm talking about the PIT because we think that it fits really well within the webinar theme today, talking about the multi-objective decision analysis. Given that this application is intended to perform pavement analysis based upon um, network and life cycle policy parameters that our pavement engineers and planners will be populating within the tool as part of the first phase of this project. And then in the future, we're hoping to integrate with um, the existing bridge management or BRM software in order to perform multi-asset analysis and are hoping to get started on that um, type of work in 2023. So a little ways from now as we're working on the first phase of the pit. So here in planning, we're also considering a research project that would investigate the methods, practices, and feasibility of using MODA, um, specifically looking at prioritizing our projects um, beyond asset condition, looking at things like mobility and safety in the environment. So, um, so the business need for the project, um, the core responsibility, as many of you are aware, obviously, we're kind of in the same boat here. Um, we are trying to maintain our pavement assets. So we follow the highway call for projects process, which drives our five-year transportation program investment strategy, as Michael mentioned. Um, we really hope that this tool can be something that assists our region system managers in identifying uh, candidate pavement projects, um, figuring out which the best fix would be for those sections of projects and recommend projects, um, kind of coupling them all together for our consideration and further analysis, and then ranking those projects based on a cost-benefit analysis. Um, in addition, um, we're hoping that this tool can be used by our central office planning staff to forecast pavement condition based on the federal pavement condition measures and also our own um, MDOT uh, remaining service life measure that we use uh, regularly to determine, um, to run analysis on what if scenarios based on funding estimates and projections that we're looking at into the future. So in parallel to this, kind of all at the same time, we're also working on a research project. Um, it's intended to deliver a deterioration model that will um, replace um, a measure called the distress index, which is a composite measure. Um, so we're hoping to have that information to be able to load into the tool in the future to allow us to forecast that PCM and then integrate that into our TAMP in the future. Next slide. So this is kind of a little bit of you know summary of what I what I just said, but really the main objective of the tool, we're really looking to connect MDOT databases in order to access all of the relevant information that we have on pavement. Um, I'll show a slide here in just a minute about all the different data sources that we have and the challenge of bringing all those different things together in order to allow the tool to uh, perform the analysis that it needs to. It's definitely been a challenge, um, but something that we're working through as a, a large team here at the department. So from there, um, the tool is going to apply weights and run optimization scenarios to identify those ideal candidate projects based on our loaded uh, goals and the resource availability that we would populate into the tool using you know, both what we know um, based on our constrained program resources and also um, future funding um, scenarios that we might be able to load into the application. And then um, utilize the results of the, um, the analysis to support our call for project selection process, the development of the five-year program, implementation of our state long-range transportation planning and uh, TAMP goals, and on other goals um, as set by the State Transportation Commission and FHWA. 
So this next slide is talking a little bit about, um, well, a lot about, as you can see, we've used this as a guide for our conversations with Mayview. Um, this is something that they've shared with us that others in this call might be familiar with, but really getting to the foundation of you know, our asset and condition data, helping us to answer some questions about what assets we have, what condition are they in, and then getting into what types of work we would apply, um, you know, what happens to a project once you've done the work, what is the deterioration curve, um, what is the change in the condition of that, um, of that pavement based on whatever um, work was applied to that pavement, depending on where it was in its life cycle. Um, and then using that information as you know, further foundation to help us answer the questions about you know, how do we prioritize projects what do we do if we have additional funding? You know, what if we, what happens if we have less funding? All these types of questions that we're hoping to be able to answer through the analysis that's performed within this tool. So quite a lot that we've been looking at over the course of the last couple of years. Um, we started this project in um, April of 2020 with Mayview. Um, a couple of years prior to that, we were working on a work plan with them. But this has been a topic of conversation at the department for many, many years. Um, so we're really excited to have something in hand here soon. Um, hopefully in the next um, in the next year we'll be done. So I think the next slide I go into a little bit more about the data sources that we're tapping into. Um, all of these things are databases in-house. We've got our transportation data management system, which has things like our AADT and CADT. We have our pavement historical database, which has um, history on you know project um, projects from from long time ago in the past and and different things. Um, uh, material composition and things like that. We are connecting into our global database, which has network information. And then we've got PaveMap, which has our condition information. And then our job net planning database, where we're connecting into current and just past project information. And then adding in some manual, um, manual information like future funding and future target information, um, PASER data, and then pulling all that into the tool. And then with an eventual output, um, from the applications and reports and things that we're working to customize right now. So um, looking into the future, we are planning to integrate with bridge management, like I'd mentioned, in order to perform that multi-asset analysis. So coupling all the information that we know about pavement along with bridge in order to be able to see kind of, you know, exactly where um, we can create some um, symmetry with our project selection. Um, and then incorporate and modernize an in-house application that we have called the Road Quality Forecasting System or RQFS that we've mentioned a couple of times. Um, we use that to generate those statewide network level forecasts, but we hope to have everything in one application. So it's just easier to uh, maintain and RQFS is a legacy application that we need to retire at some point. And then uh, we're looking at lots, uh, life cycle cost analysis at the section level in order to compare, you know, we wanna kind of like drill down uh, at the um, individual project level to be able to compare the benefits of um, one project action against another. Um, and then in the future, hopefully be able to incorporate some of those non-asset multi-objective decision analysis components that we're talking about today during this session. So looking to the future, kind of trying to set this all up so we have it available to us um, when the time comes. So that's all I had for you guys today. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Uh, if you do have questions for Lina or Michael, uh, please do use the chat. Same, same. Uh, if you have questions for any of our other speakers. Next up, we've got Randy Chapman from uh, Louisiana DOTD. Okay, uh, that'll work. Uh, okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm the uh, asset management engineer in uh, Louisiana and LIDOTD, and uh, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, cover the uh, investment strategies and cross asset resource allocation process we use. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's see, uh, Louisiana has implemented a cross-asset resource allocation approach based on performance targets. We don't currently consider the MOTA multi-objection decision analysis right now. Uh, basically, uh, the key point with Louisiana is we have a, a lot of bridges, uh, large bridges, 3,045 NHS bridges. We have 13,000 total, but these are the ones that are NHS with around 130 uh, million square feet of deck area. And that's currently the fourth highest total deck area in the nation, just behind Florida, which uh, becomes a key point for us or an Achilles heel. Uh, next slide, please. Let's see. Uh, 
this basically covers the, the regs that the uh, agencies have to devise investment strategies. And I think we pretty well covered this uh, earlier. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, and basically that's the map 21 definition, FHWA definition above. We pretty well covered that. The investment strategies, uh, uh, the key to it is, uh, becomes the uh, pavement and bridge management systems running an iterative process. And uh, the outcome of the investment strategies will lead to identifying the performance targets where they'll be met. Uh, next slide, please. Let's see, uh, the, uh, uh, the federal funding match shortfalls uh, is one of our key points. Uh, we uh, have 1980s era uh, transportation trust fund funding. So we're, uh, we're always, uh, it'll uh, challenge to get the uh, federal fund match. Uh, and if we do have a, a funding shortfall, of course we would uh, have a possible penalty assessment. Uh, and that is the thing we have to watch uh, the most. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Office of Planning uh, projects annual highway budget petitions out for 10 years uh, and, and every year, and they provide the uh, projected funding for the investment strategies. These serve as the agency's tactical plans represented by the annual highway priority program. Uh, preservation focuses on uh, minimizing the worst first strategy, of course, but, but we found that Worst first strategies can't be totally eliminated. Uh, some assets simply can't be removed from the system. So probably the best example of that would be the uh, high volume NHS routes. They just, they can't be taken off, off the system. Uh, the next slide, please. Let's see. Uh, the, uh, so again, back to the iterative uh, uh, performance management system, bridge and, uh, management system analyses which is really the key to the, the funding uh, projections is uh, utilizing various budget scenarios on the different asset subgroups to identify the most compelling funding for each asset class using the actual treatments. And that'd be your work types uh, that we're familiar with. Next slide, please. And uh, from that, we select the most opportune cross asset uh, resource allocation uh, for each asset class. Uh, we allocate funding to the bridge asset classes in that order uh, there, the NHS first and work our way down uh, as a uh, state highway system, rural highway system bridges. Same for the pavement, pretty much uh, start with the interstate and work our way down uh, non-interstate uh, and uh, all the way down to state highway system, rural highway. On uh, all assets, the bridges take priority over the pavements uh, for funding when funding constraints are encountered. Uh, the concept here is that gravel roads can be used, but closed bridges become dead ends. And that's uh, uh, been our focus. Uh, and we provide sufficient funding on to the NSH assets to remain penalty free. That's another key aspect. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, annually, the uh, secretary and the executive committee meet to review the investment strategies to update the annual budget petitions that are projected the next 10 years. And the process includes a review of the, those following uh, criteria there. I'll let you read those. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, using this information, considering the recommendations of asset management engineer and the TAM steering committee, the secretary and executive committee will consider whether or not to adjust the investment strategy. This is where the, the adjustments are made. The final set of the investment strategies are communicated to uh, the agency personnel via the annual highway budget petitions and the project selections within the annual uh, highway priority program. Next slide, please. And the question is how can current available funding for asset management activities change in the future? Uh, the federal requirements for the state DOT TAMS call for uh, the following three scenarios. Uh, scenario one, funding can be estimated to be reasonably available. Scenario two, funding required to achieve federal performance target. Scenario three, funding required to maintain asset value. Uh, next slide, please. And the uh, NCHRP uh, report 898 also has additional scenarios to consider. Uh, it's good for review. Next slide, please. Uh, the historical approach in the past, uh, DOTD set budgets based on historical levels and adjusted those levels based on the explicit needs of assets facing critical issues or mandates. This often supported the worst first approach. Uh, however, 
uh, the updated approach, the analysis begins with PMS and BMS evaluation, uh, which the bottom line at the bottom there, the final outcome is a proposed budget that maximizes the life cycle of the various NHS asset classes. My next slide, please. Uh, let's see, we, uh, the, the problem we found with the initial results of the year, were, it was immediately apparent that these previous funding levels cannot achieve the pavement or bridge condition targets and would result in significant performance gaps as well as condition states above the minimum interstate pavement or NHS bridge requirements leading to future penalty assessments. So we had to start running alternate funding scenarios to figure out how much money it would take to fix the problem. Uh, and so a bunch of different funding scenarios were evaluated. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the bottom line. Uh, on the right hand side there, you'll see the uh, BMS, PMS, basically your funding for the interstates that require 33 million for interstate pavement, 83 million for non-interstate pavement, and at the bottom 101 million for uh, NHS bridges. And on the left, you'll see what we actually funded it at. Uh, they bumped it some, increased it to make sure we made it. 35 million for interstate, 90 million for non-interstate NHS, and for the bridges, uh, 134 million. So the uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, this basically achieved the funding required to meet the federal performance targets, uh, but also the funding required to maintain asset value. And the same had been accomplished for the, uh, for the pavements, for the bridges, the same thing. We were able to meet the uh, uh, projections. Uh, let's see, this funding will be reasonably available, we decided. So all three of those scenarios were met, as you can see. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the project selection, uh, which is the bottom line, the uh, NHS pay pavements, the primary source of information for future project selection will be the recommendations created through this effort using the pavement management system. Uh, on the bridges, uh, the bridge NBI condition data is used as a guiding source of information for future project selection. The intent will be to focus on keeping fair bridges in the fair condition and good bridges in the good condition. Uh, integrating the uh, uh, HISIP and the uh, Louisiana Freight Mobility Plan in will further improve our cross asset resource allocation in the uh, future uh, for project selection strategies. And this will allow project selection efforts to uh, ensure a more uh, TAM life cycle uh, based approach going forward, which will help ensure that the looming wave of our aging bridge assets, which were from the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s uh, interstate program, will be addressed with uh, limited available funds. Uh, next slide, please. And then that's some of the uh, regulations. I just threw them in here for reference and hit the next one as well. And then one more. That's the regs. And then if you have any questions, please email me or call me. I'll be glad to uh, provide information. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Randy. I like the quote from Roberto Clemente. Uh, uh -huh. Next up, we've got um, Steve Wilcox and uh, Mike, Michael Rossi from New York State DOT. Hi, can you see the screen? Yes. All right, it's working. All right, Steve, you want to start? Why don't you kick it off, Mike, since you've got the second slide? Sure, why not? Uh, thank you guys for uh, joining us today. Um, we have a nice, quick presentation for you guys. Uh, today we're going to talk about asset trade-off analysis. Uh, the lessons learned here at NISDOT, we uh, implemented program-level trade-off as opposed to project-level trade-off uh, here at DOT. Um, and the idea here of the program level trade-off is to maximize the benefit of a given mix of pavement and bridge programs. So essentially what you are doing is you are running your pavement and bridge models uh, to get optimized programs at different funding values. And then you're combining those programs together to see what gives you the best overall system benefit. Um, benefits, you know, we, we get together a cross as a trade-off team here and the benefits could include things, now you would imagine system-wide condition but would, would be one of them, but other things that you could look at that apply to both pavements and bridges would be reduced maintenance costs, um, increased traffic mobility, maybe reduction in construction impacts of greenhouse gas emissions. 
that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of other factors that you can uh, put into this uh, analysis besides just the straight conditions, right? Um, and the key to making it work is you get the team together and essentially you are determining uh, the benefits that you're going to measure, the relative weighting between those benefits, and then the actual benefit calculation curves for each one of those factors that you determine. Um, so there's a kind of a lot that goes into it, right? Um, but turn it over to Steve. All right, just taking a step back, back around 2011, we really had a, a major focus on asset management and we started implementing a major enterprise asset management system that includes pavement management, bridge management, maintenance management. We've always been good at uh, pavement management, bridge management. We've been doing them for a, th those things for a long time. But when it comes to you know making decisions outside of the asset classes themselves, you know we started years ago using inventory, and then we moved to 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 needs as a way of allocating funds across assets and uh, across regions. But that still didn't seem like a the necessarily the best way to allocate across you know across asset classes. I always ask myself the question: It's you know, we do, we're doing a good job within the class, but what if, you know, our balance between pavements and bridges and safety is is way out of whack? How do how would we know? And I ran across something from uh, uh, Utah because they've always been doing some really cool stuff with asset management. And I, I saw this and here's a way of actually being able to trade off. This is project level trade off analysis. But what was appealing about it is the fact that it's really goal and outcome oriented, you know, so and, and they had these cool sliders to be able to say, you know, so if we want to increase preservation or a little less safety, a little more mobility. And they also had this category, which I thought was very clever, called criticality, which is about making strategic investments. So uh, how do we want to trade off our investment in condition versus safety? but also taking into account those projects that really come from a lot of times external sources. They may be politically driven. They may be driven for economic reasons or, or other reasons. Um, so it seemed like a, a very interesting way to, uh, to, to trade off and, 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 make, and make those kinds of decisions. Mike? All right, so how did we, uh, how, how did we do this at, in New York? As Mike mentioned, we're doing program level trade-off analysis and not project level. So just giving us a simple overview, we brought a team together that represented the key stakeholders um, and subject matter experts from planning, uh, pavement management, uh, bridge management and maintenance and asset management. And we went through a process of brainstorming factors that we should consider. You know, what are the key things that we need to consider uh, when when making decisions about uh, how how to trade these things off? Interesting thing, I'll, I'll mention this in the next slide. Is we found some very interesting symmetry. I mean, you create utility functions largely because you're trying to trade off unlike things, right? So you're, you you're, you start looking at utility as a way to do that. But we found a remarkable similarity in the things that we really valued in managing pavements and bridges. And again, I'll mention that, I'll, I'll get into that in the next slide. Uh, once we did that, we weighted the factors against each other so we could build these utility functions. And the, one of the goals was in, in building our enterprise asset management platform, um, we're implementing a, a, a tool called Portfolio Analyst and we needed the utility functions to be able to build that tool so that we could do program level trade-off. Right, Mike? So this is the interesting thing, you know, in developing this criteria, you know, we looked at, uh, we, we really came down in the end to three primary categories. Uh, uh, maintenance focus, which is really proxy for a change in backlog, change in economic backlog. What's the cost of all that, um, all those unmet needs for pavements and bridges? Because uh, we don't want that to grow too large. Uh, condition focus, and this is really the central hub of all of this, is as we all know from pavement and bridge management, the key is keeping 
your assets in a higher condition state because the costs go up geometrically as you go from preservation treatments to corrective repairs to you know renewals and replacements. So you're trying to keep things in those higher condition states. So there's a real focus in trying to look at what those triggers are, uh, where those points are when you go from a preservable pavement to one that needs you know, more repair or one that needs to be reconstructed. And lastly, a user focus to try to set some sort of maximum uh, in terms of percent poor, not enough to drive us to, or to, uh, to worse first, but enough to be mindful of the fact that we don't want that poor, um, whether it's pavements or bridges to, to get to be too high. Uh, Bill Roberts, you probably recognize, I'm sure you recognize a lot of this, but uh, and Mike and I went to uh, one of Bill's trainings on, on Moda, which was excellent. And um, part of that is in, in, it, in trying to create these utility functions, what you need to be able to do is, is value things, you know, like, like how important are bridges versus pavements. But also as we're looking at these things like uh, bridge backlog, pavement backlog, uh, the, the fall from a fair protective to a fair protective bridge or corrective to poor, you go through all the combinations of, of those things, bridge backlog versus pavement backlog, or bridge fair corrective versus poor pavement. And we look at those on a 10 point scale, you know, uh, ver one versus the other. So how important is it, is the bridge more important? How much more important, you know, uh, in, these, in these areas? And that gave us our priority weightings for our utility functions. Mike? So once you have that utility function, essentially what that is, it's a big equation that gives you the overall benefit of the combinations of your pavement and bridge programs, right? So the next step is to run your pavement model and your bridge model uh, to get optimum results for a range of funding levels. So uh, for example, here you, you can do 100, 200, 300 million all the way up to let's say one and a half billion for each of the assets. And then you combine the them together, right? For an overall budget, let's say you have a billion dollars, one of your um, options may be 200 million pavement, 800 million bridges, three, seven, four, six, like that, right? So you, what you're doing is you're plugging all of these different combinations in together for varying levels of funding and you're running it through the utility function to figure out the overall benefit. When you do all the combinations, what you end up with is essentially a set of uh, benefit calculations as shown here. Now there's a lot going on here, but what you are looking at here is essentially the, the benefits that are graphed, if they are uh, higher up or higher to the right, then they are better um, from, than the ones that are toward the, the lower left quadrant. And anything along that outer axis, that outer line is called essentially that's your Pareto frontier. And those are the, the highest benefit combinations that you can have at those funding levels, okay? So when you combine all those, essentially what you're getting is a performance curve that says, these are the best outcomes, these are the highest benefits, and these are the different combinations um, of pavement and bridge funding that will get you those highest benefits. Okay, once you have those, then it's pretty easy. Now you have an optimum for each funding level. Well, what we found when we did that is um, at lower funding levels, it behooved us to spend more, a higher percentage of the funding on pavements. Only when we got to around $1.5 billion in total sp spending, did it make more sense to start spending more on bridges. And at first you say, wow, that, that seems kind of, Kind of counterintuitive bridges in our uh, previous example the actual benefit calculation for bridges was 55 percent of the benefit was in bridges why would it be well because pavements and the way that they deteriorate they deteriorate very quickly and the cost to fix them is relatively cheap right to keep them at those higher condition states and keep the backlog low whereas structures deteriorate very slowly but when they shift from condition state to condition state they're very expensive to fix so because of that, it does make sense that your first 500, 600, 700 million dollars should go toward pavement. And then later on, a majority of your funding should go to bridges, right? Because you're getting the overall benefit 
uh, at the lower value, at the lower total dollar value, you're getting more benefit by spending more of that money on payment, right? So we went through this and, and, and uh, really at the end of this, it was funny, we, we uh, as a group, we agreed on, the, on the, the factors for the benefit calculation, we agreed on the utility function, we agreed on the calculations, and then we all got together and looked at the results, right? And so with that, I'll kick it to Steve to talk about the results. And <laughs> here's the school of hard knocks. But but before that, I, I want to reiterate what Mike said, that kind of the moment of, of Satori, of, of, of insight from this was, to, and I'd never thought about it this way, you, you have pavements which have a Gatsby value of more than two and a half the Gatsby value of our bridges, right? So you have this, this, this massive investment in, in your asset that deteriorates pretty quickly, but you can treat pretty at, at, at pretty low costs. And you wanna keep that massive asset um, well-fed, you know, and, and, and in good condition, because when something like that falls into a, a reconstruction state, you're, you'll never be able to afford your way out of that. And part of that is because we know pavements deteriorate quickly and bridges deteriorate slowly. So the time it takes to hit those trigger points um, for bridges is a lot longer than it takes to get to those trigger points for pavements. That's why it drives that early investment, um, which I just, I thought was, was extremely interesting when, when, when that came out and, and it struck me as, as, as being intuitive, but it didn't necessarily strike everyone as being intuitive. Um, uh, I do think it's important that we, we got folks from uh, different program areas, key stakeholders, subject matter experts into this process um, to, to get their, their insights. And as, as Mike said, sometimes when all A is B and all B is C, all A is not necessarily C, you know? Um, and why is that? Because um, we have a long history in, in the way we uh, uh, program uh, projects across asset classes. That is, you know, as engineers and stuff, we're very conservative. And we have built up a level of, of judgment and intuition um, that is very hard to shake. And ATOA can create what is perceived as winners and losers because if ATOA is not reinforcing your traditional investment strategy, somebody's gonna have a, a, an issue with that. So um, you have to ask yourself going into this is what, do you, what happens when the results run counter to what, you've historically done. Um, and I'm not saying that isn't necessarily even that the model is right or wrong, but when the model tells you something that's different from what you've done in the past, uh, when you get into this, you need to get into this thinking about, you know, what if that happens? You know, how do you, how do you handle that when, when the math does not um, line up with, with history? Um, and, the, and the way you've done things in the past. So that is, that is, that is the lesson and that is what we are trying to work on, on now. We've, we've built these utility functions into our asset management system, but we are not investing using this trade-off tool because right now we're, we have to work through um, uh, trying to get the culture, trying to get folks to better understand what asset trade-off is you know, so that we might be able to use it in the future. So th um, with that, we're done, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, very fascinating presentation on a great topic. Uh, our last speaker is Mike Johnson from Caltrans. I think um, Perry will be operating the slides for Mike. So just uh, let her rip, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm here today. I'm gonna talk about the efforts that Caltrans has had uh, really over the past seven years to uh, improve our understanding and use of MODA. Um, next slide, Perry. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, over the seven year period, we've had uh, five different uh, research and or pilot efforts with a whole host of people involved. And I just wanna acknowledge, uh, I'm not certainly not gonna go through all the names here, um, but uh, there was a lot of people involved. This wasn't uh, just, you know, Mike Johnson. It was a, a lot of Caltrans and a lot of um, support externally uh, from 
universities and from consultants. Next slide. So why did we wanna do something different? Well, you gotta wind the clock back a bit. Um, our funding uh, for our major programs back in say 2015 or 2014 involved taking the total available budget, carving up into slices and saying, here's the bridge slice, here's the pavement slice. Uh, and we would give that slice to uh, managers that were responsible for determining projects statewide uh, to use those funds. So <clears throat> under that model, the prioritization occurred within each category. So bridge would prioritize bridge and pavement would prioritize pavement. Um, but there were some challenges with that. Uh, for, for one thing, you know, how, how do you determine how much money to give to bridge versus pavement? Uh, and in our case, we we're dividing the pie up into 36 different pieces um, because the pie has to also handle safety and congestion and a whole host of other things. Um, and, and then we had another challenge in that when we had this <clears throat> pie slice based approach, um, there, was, there was almost no incentive for any one program to accept work that was broader than just that asset. So if we were trying to do a pavement job and we wanted to go across a bridge, the pavement program would never wanna pay for the bridge work. And so it led to um, some not really good practices in terms of um, how we were managing our projects. And then there's, there was emerging things like, well, how do we bring in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure or um, you know, other uh, environmental improvements along with our projects. And those may have a cost factor associated with them. And so the individual program managers were um, not super excited about using their, you know, what their perceived payment dollars or bridge dollars to, to fund these other things. And then there was, you know, how do you align all of this with the strategic uh, objectives of the department? So in light of these challenges in 2014, we, we began evaluating different approaches. Next slide. Um, so a little bit about MODA. Um, one, it's very data-driven if you haven't got that impression from the prior presenters. Uh, so you've got to have good data and it, it requires defining a formal hierarchy of objectives or, or utility functions and then quantifying um, uh, you know, how these, uh, how these objectives apply to different candidate projects. Next slide. So what are the advantages? Well, it, it brings transparency. So if you had to explain to someone, well, how did you arrive at this portfolio of projects? There's a very logical, explainable path um, to do that. It's, and again, it's very data-driven. Um, you, you can trace how you how you got to project level decisions and and you can communicate that alignment of, of your projects with strategic objectives of your agency and it, it also identifies you know the best projects across asset types so you you kind of break down this whole silo based approach um, that we had back in 2014 next slide so, you know, uh, I mean, this is a conceptual diagram, but you have as a, as a department or an agency, you have probably a number of goals and those goals may be achieved through a number of different objectives. And you can evaluate each of those objectives based on a set of technical uh, data. Next slide. So this is one, uh, uh, well, this is our initial work actually. So. Uh, you have in kind of the lighter brown color, you have the department's five strategic goals. Uh, so we have a safety and health goal, stewardship and efficiency, system performance. Uh, we had a sustainability, livability and economy goal, and we had an organizational excellence goal. And under each one of those goals, you can establish uh, fundamental objective functions. For example, under safety and health, we wanna minimize injuries and fatalities. Uh, you know, we want to maximize community health through active transportation and so forth. Um, and then <clears throat> underneath each of those fundamental objectives, you may have sub objectives. And so you, in effect, get like a tree type of structure. Next slide. 
So this is kind of a blow up of the stewardship and efficiency one because this one has a lot of direct bearing on the TAMP. Um, so, you know, you can look at things like, well, we want condition improvement. We want to um, put some value on the consequence if we don't do something. In other words, if we don't take action and there's some devastating consequence, that's not gonna be good. And then we also might wanna make um, our value decisions based on how many people are actually using that facility. So usage could come in and then, and then funding sometimes comes in. So if we can maximize funding from other sources like our federal partners, um, instead of using state funding sources, that's seen as advantageous. But one of the things you'll notice here is that steward, stewardship and efficiency is one of five goals in our department. You have four sub objectives under that. So if you give a, a total utility value of, of, of one or 100% for this goal, you have to then decide, um, just as you saw from New York and others, how much of that 100% is attributed to condition improvement or consequence or usage or funding. Um, and so you're, you're in effect taking it that 100%, you're splitting it into your sub objectives. Um, and then you're developing technical criteria with project data to evaluate how those sub objectives um, uh, measure. Next slide. So what's interesting is that you saw, uh, sorry, Perry, could you go back one slide? So you'll see here that you're taking that 100% of stewardship and efficiency, but then you've got these other goals, right? And each of the goals themselves have their own weight. Next slide. So in one of our early works, we polled a number of executives using an analytical hierarchy method. And we said, well, how much do you value goal one, goal two, goal three, goal four, and goal five? And um, it was really interesting because there was a big scatter and you could see all the, the various dots. In other words, um, you know, probably with the exception of goal three, which was probably the tightest, um, you saw a lot of distribution. In other words, everybody's perception of the right answer could potentially be different. And this is one of the things that um, we actually took an exercise like this to our external partners and we asked them to prioritize it. And that was very eye-opening for them uh, on how difficult it was. And, and also very eye-opening for us because we, we realized that our partners don't even have a common expectation of what, we of what we deliver in our projects. Next slide. So um, our initial mode of work or what I'm calling initial mode of work uh, took place in 2014 and 2016. I wanted to talk a little bit about the lessons learned. Um, you know, developing these comprehensive objective hierarchies is, is very challenging. Um, you know, it, it sounds easy on paper, but when you actually go to do it, uh, it's, it's a little tricky and, and normalizing them. So, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna try to normalize um, on a zero to one scale or zero to 100 scale, um, you know, this, this idea of sustainability and stewardship and safety and, and how you go about doing that can be tricky. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the weighting of these various objectives, um, you know, it, it varies. Different people have different perceptions of what the appropriate weights are. And, and weighting of the objective just in general is problematic. Um, because it will favor projects that hit multiple categories. Um, in other words, if you're not doing anything in the area of sustainability, whatever weight was attributed to that goal, your project's not gonna get any value from. And so, you know, overall the goal weighting approach really lacked a lot of consensus. And then the other big challenge with MODA is scaling of benefits. And this is particularly true um, when you start bringing in risk. So if you think about something like the scour mitigation of a bridge, um, a big bridge you can mitigate the scour for uh, is gonna cost a lot more than a little bridge mitigating scour for. But on a risk scale, if you're just looking at the fact that it was scour critical and now it's not, those in a sense have equal benefit even though the cost to execute that work would be dramatically different. 
Next slide. So one, one solution to this weighting problem is to look at benefit monetization because ultimately your, your value functions are trying to assess a benefit. Um, and if you can get away from a, a utility in that sense to a monetized benefit, then you don't have to rely on this weighting so much. Um, but, and so it sounds really good. We did a research project on it. There is some uh, advantages to monetizing, but monetizing certain things are really difficult. Um, you know, how do you monetize risk reduction for a seismic event, uh, for example? Or, um, you know, what about usage-based objectives? How do, you, how do you monetize the benefit of replacing a curb ramp to make it uh, ADA uh, compliant? And, and same with environmental objectives. Uh, we have objectives for greenhouse gas reduction. You know, how do you, how do you measure that at a project level and how do you put a cost on it? So there, there, are still, um, there are still challenges, even though you don't have to wait the way you did in a utility, a pure um, you know, utility value function approach, you still have to make some assumptions on how you monetize. And then you still have scaling challenges. So this, you know, scour mitigation, large bridge versus small, you haven't really solved that problem just by monetizing. Next slide. So um, <clears throat> we did our 2014, 2016, um, our 2014 was the initial work. And then in 2016, we said, well, let's put some money to this. So we put $100 million to it. And we said, we're gonna allocate this $100 million based on a MODA approach. We had all of our districts submit projects um, and, um, and then we evaluated them using our utility functions um, and we awarded the money um, in, the, in the form of those districts got extra projects. Then we took the results of all of that and we kicked it over to a bunch of, uh, well, to Spy Pond and to a number of uh, industry experts academic and consultant experts. And coming out of that, we revised our, our utility functions a bit and they were improved quite a bit. Um, still the same five goals, uh, but we, we streamlined and we got rid of some um, uh, technical issues and how uh, some of them were structured and other things. Uh, next slide. And so in this approach, you know, you're going to take the same five goals, you're going to combine those goals all together in the benefits, but the benefits in this case are measured in terms of dollars. Um, and in theory, then you would have dollars of benefit divided by dollars of cost to give you a benefit cost ratio that then you could compare uh, one project to the next. Next slide. And so, you know, what you're hoping for is something like this, where these little blue lines on the left are individual projects and you see that a project can actually be satisfying multiple uh, strategic goals of the department at the same time. And so you wanna see you know, some mix and certainly you, know, you want your safety projects to primarily have safety benefits, but um, there is other safety benefits being realized, for example, in pavement projects and bridge projects. And so you're trying to capture, if you will, all of the safety benefits. Next slide. And so here's a sample calculation. Um, you know, you can you can see the the um, uh, annual benefit in dollars um, based on the goal and the objectives, and and you can see kind of how you add this all up, and you get a total um, you know annual monetized benefit at the bottom. Next slide. So. Um, you know, we did that work. Um, and as part of that work, we actually uh, had Dr. Alex Engau um, evaluate a number of opti optimization approaches. And um, these are all documented in our, in our publication, if anyone's interested, but did a really nice job evaluating the pros and cons of different um, methods of optimization. Um, and then most recently, uh, we started uh, doing some work uh, with uh, Dr. Mahmoud Hathaway. Um, and this was looking at bringing risk directly into the value functions and then 
and then using those value functions uh, in a cross asset optimization approach. In other words, we we are um, we're not this is not a silo based approach. We're actually calculating value um, uh, across the various assets and are able to make decisions about appropriate levels of funding uh, for the different asset classes. And then, you know, uh, the, the most recent work that we've started doing is looking at um, a software product called Copperleaf uh, C55. Um, this is a software tool that has largely been used in the power industry, uh, but it includes, um, it includes MOTA capabilities and we're looking at that framework for potential implementation. Next slide. And with that, um, thank everybody for their time. Uh, my email address is there on the slide if there's any questions. Um, appreciate the opportunity to uh, describe what Caltrans has been doing in the MOTA arena for about the last seven years. All right, thank you, Mike, for that great presentation. And thank you to all of our presenters. Um, so let's have a questions and answers. So if you have a question, you can um, put it into the chat function or unmute yourself and ask it. Um, let's start with Matt Habrick has a question that Caltrans has some published reports. He'd like to know where he can find those. Mike? Um, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, they were all originally on dot.ca.gov uh, in our asset management arena. Um, they have been uh, pulled down because of uh, ADA concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not remediated documents back in the day. So um, we're, we're working on trying to figure out how to get those. But if um, if there's a need for them, we could probably provide them uh, here to Ashto for, for posting on the TAM portal. That would be great. Thanks, Mike. Um, I have a question for all of the panelists. So, you know, it seems like you've all um, have made uh, progress on um, investment strategies development and using MODA. Um, if you were to give advice to other agencies who are embarking on, um, on in this area, what resources would you suggest that they turn to to help them? Um, so let's start with Michigan. Sorry, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> you just put us right on the spot like that. I honestly, I mean, we have a ton of resources on our website. Mike um, added some links to our presentation. We put our TAMP out there. Um, I'm yeah. always happy to share information about the project that we're working on with the PIT. Um, we've got our five-year program information. We also have the TAMC website linked up in our presentation. So those are some resources for us. Obviously, you guys have a ton of resources on the TAM webinar series. Mm -hmm. um, um, website there. So, I mean, that's a really great place to start and I'm really impressed with all the content everyone else has shared. So everybody here, so really. Yeah, yeah. it sounds, I think what you're saying, Lina, is just um, looking at what you all have done and anybody else who've embarked on this and just sharing it with each other is probably a great resource. Yeah. Um, Randy, how about you? Do you have any recommendations? Uh, well, I think our we we've kept ours pretty simple, you know, with the cross asset uh, uh, resource allocations, and uh, rather than the motive at this point, uh, and it's I think if, you know with our overwhelming bridge uh, square footage, you know, I think it's it's uh, it, we've kept it simple, and I think that's it's worked well for us so far, and uh, uh, otherwise I don't uh, look, that's that's about it for me. All right, thank you, Randy. How about New York State? So I just want to I just want to reiterate something that was said earlier that we're all in this together, and I think anybody can reach out to Steve or I at any time to ask us our our experience. You know, um, mm -hmm. that is one of the best things about having the resources like the TAM portal and us getting together like this. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm involved in a couple uh, TRB committees, and this is the strongest committee, I think, when it comes to cross-pollination of ideas and just our outreach over the course of the year. So if you guys need anything, please reach out to Steve and I at any time. We'd love to talk. That sounds great. Uh, I, I don't have much more to add other than um, obviously the, 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 the mode of training that has been provided through the mm -hmm. feds. Um, we did that down in New York City, which is not an easy place to gain consensus. And uh, that, that training went, went very well. So I'd certainly recommend that. And the other thing is when you get into some of these utility functions, um, there's some higher level math there that <laughs> I certainly know I need help with. And you know, I can't, we can't endorse consultants or anything, um, but there are there's some very good consultants out there to help you um, uh, go through that process and help you go through the modeling and, and, and all of that. But that's all I've got, you know, yeah. Thanks, Steve. How about you, Cal, um, Mike? Um, I, you know, in addition to the things that have been noted, um, I, I find a lot of value in NCHRP report 590. And, you know, 590 is related to MODA for bridge management, but I think um, it, it does a really good job of explaining the concepts and laying it out. Great. All right. Um, all right, Bill, do you have any suggestions? Uh, oh, just had to unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, report earlier, we mentioned that besides what's in the TAM guide, we've also got NCHRP report uh, 921 that, that talks specifically about MODA. I think the, the, um, the MODA training that uh, Steve and Mike mentioned, that's now been turned into an ASHTO um, training course that, that, um, that you can get to and take online. Yeah, I think the, um, the ASHTO training course is on the TPM portal. Uh, you can get to it, it's through the ASHTO store. And if you're uh, a part of um, the TC3 kind of program and a member, I think it's free. Otherwise, it might be $75 to take. Um, the other resource that's there is, um, is the MODAT tool that's also available for free to anyone who wants to use it. And, um, and so that's also on the TPM portal. Um, Matt Hobrick mentions NCHRP report 806 as well, which was the precursor to the report 921 that Bill just mentioned. Um, all right. Um, there's a question for Mike that I think you answered, but do you think about simple multi-attribute review technique, SMART, as compared to analytic hierarchy process? Mike, do you want to just verbally share your response? Yeah, I just, um, you know, at the time, um, and this is going back a number of years, I, I don't recall if we had evaluated the SMART approach. Um, we developed a little tool in Microsoft Excel that did an, an analytical hierarchy process, and uh, it was pretty well received. Like people liked using it. Um, you know, it just unfortunately in the process, I think the outcomes that we learned was that, you know, everybody's got a different idea of what the right answer is. And um, I think that's a really important thing for everybody here that, you know, when you want to, you want to do a MODA approach, you, you realize that at the end of the day, it's going to be, you know, it's very data driven and it's one size fits all. So, you know, you're, you're going to get every project running through the same process. And if you're an agency that's accustomed to making a lot of um, judgments about projects um, or you know, those sort of uh, intangibles are, are causing projects to move forward versus not move forward. It may be very difficult for you in a MODA environment because you may not be able to get the calculations to give you the answers that, 
you know, maybe are perceived to be right. Thanks, Mike. Um, so another question for the, um, the panel, um, you know, as you think about, um, you know, and reflect on your experience, really, your goal is to help your agency make better resource allocation decisions using um, better strategies and multi-objective decision analysis. But what would you say um, was the most challenging element of that, that journey that, because I think as you've all described, it is a journey and you're not probably done with it. Like what is, you know, the, the, the kind of the most notable challenge? Who wants to go first? So this is Mike in New York. I'll, I'll go and dive in first. Uh, the challenge, and, and we, we alluded to this before, and actually Mike just, Mike just mentioned it. When you run through everything and you have this pre preconceived idea of this is how we've been doing things for a long time, and then the, you go through all the trouble of, of running through Moda, you, you get the consensus, and then you don't like the results, or it's challenging to what you've done before. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we mentioned in our last slide is that there are winners and there are losers in a zero-sum game, right? If I've only got one and a half billion dollars to spend, um, and I'm saying I need to take money from somewhere else and put it toward this other asset, then people get very protected very quickly, right? Um, which I think you get at program level asset trade-off. I think that is a thing that is much more prevalent than project level. On a project by project basis, I think it's, you don't have that same um, you know, level of, I'm gonna say ownership uh, over the program, or, you know, over your asset. I mean, I'm, I'm a pavement engineer, I'm not a structures engineer, right? So I think that that is, and then you know the the guys on the other side would say the same thing, um, but I think on a project level basis you don't run into that obstinance of winners and losers, right at at the program level. But, but you kind of have to know that going in, you know. But, but Mike, as you know, as as you know, the the other side of that was when you do a program level trade off, you end up with the pavement people versus the bridge people, right? When you do project level, you now you've got the, the the planning folks that say that you know planning is much more complex than any model can uh, you know can can handle right and there's an awful lot of judgment uh, in in the whole planning process that you can't model um, so it's a different kind of I mean it's a different kind of issue and I think I that's kind of what I got out of Mike's presentation as well is trying to model a multiple of, of objectives and try to get a feel for what is, whether you came up with the right answer versus program level, at least at the program level, at the end of the day, I can rub my belly and say, yeah, this is right. You know, I think the model we have is at least seems, I can stand behind that. I can defend it, you know, um, right. where it's harder when you're trying to do project level to know really whether you're there. Cause I think everyone sees that from you know, from, from many different perspectives. Right. And then the other thing, and this was mentioned earlier, is that uh, it's very easy when you're sitting in a room to say, yeah, we should take a look at greenhouse gases or, for example, right. But then getting, because Moda is so data driven, being able to get the right, you know, how many, how, what is the greenhouse gas emissions attached to this one project? And you end up making a lot of assumptions. Um, and so you got to be careful about the assumptions you make because those will skew your results or how you actually, you know, uh, figure out your benefits, et cetera. There's a lot of assumptions that go into a, a lot of this. And so everybody kind of, ha kind of has to be level set together as you develop it as a group. Thanks guys. All right, hey, Matt Hobrick, I'll have you make the last comment that you put into the chat before we just close out the session. <laughs> well, uh, I just, as Mike was, was kind of talking, it, uh, it, um, uh, Mike Johnson, Caltrans, uh, from, from Caltrans was talking, it kind of reminded me of this quote that I had read in an article last year that was talking about transportation planning. And, <clears throat> um, you know, I think in my mind kind of uh, resonates with this whole conversation because what, really what we're trying to do is, is you know, as, a, as all the speakers I've talked about is come up with sort of a, a more uh, objective approach or mathematical approach to try to 
to come up with prioritization, but these decisions have always been very political, right? And so I think, you know, uh, and and part of the reason is because they're complex and they're they're um, they're driven by, as this as this author says, by uh, rival systems of what's good uh, in our in our system. And so, you know, I, I've kind of come to the the thought that I'm not sure that it's really possible to get to consensus because everyone's going to view the answer differently. You know, sort of like Mike was showing in that um, chart showing how all the executives were all over the map in terms of how they evaluated each of those criteria. Uh, you know, the, the, the five guiding principles of their agency, they didn't even have consensus on how important each of those were, you know, much less as you start to drill down. And so I think, you know, to me, maybe it makes more sense to focus on this concept of, of transparency and try to make it uh, a more simple, uh, straightforward kind of model. But, you know, that, that I know that there's a lot of reasons why we may want to go deeper than that, but that that's just my my thought as I'm hearing all this conversation. Thanks, Matt. All right, Perry, let's go to the last slide. And just in closing, we have um, one more webinar in this TAM Guide Book Club series on strengthening how data supports your TAM program. So we hope you join us. We're back to Wednesday next week from 2 to 3.30 Eastern time. And if you have other um, ideas for webinars, please send them to us um, to, or to Matt Hardy, and we'll get, get them on our schedule. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to all of our presenter, this, presenters. This was a terrific session.